Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Mission Also Against the Death Meter. Thanks uh, to Skills Master for hosting. Um, and we've got two great speakers today, um, both of them coincidentally from their budget. Um, so you're here from Joe Cape, who is first, who's going to be speaking to us for concepts to do with functional programming. And then following that, we have Stu Harris, who is going to talk today to say that he's going to share um, his opinions about the so if you do want to speak, again, tips, you can email us at hello at redbadger.com or message us on the Meetup um, webpage. Um, the hashtag for this deal is Funk London and Red Badger is Harry. So speak to one of us later. There'll be just a few badges floating around. So let's go Good evening. Uh, so I just need to get my slides going, just a sec. <clears throat> That's it. Okay. So um, tonight I wanted to talk about uh, what I've titled the language of functional. Um, so we think about mapping, filtering, reducing as being functional, but I think a lot of us don't actually understand what these things actually mean. So what I'd like to present is some of the high level concepts behind those things and uh, take a deeper dive into those patterns and that we already use and hopefully reveal a few more um, programming lives easier. So I am RGB boy on Twitter uh, and I work with Red Badger. So, um, ground, I started as um, a JavaScript developer. So I've been doing JavaScript for probably like I don't know, seven, eight years now. Um, and in the last probably just over 12 months, I started getting into Elm and playing around with that. And uh, I love it. So I wanted to kind of touch on a few things there. Um, let's see. Elm. Uh, Elm does a really good job of uh, allowing us to use patterns without fully understanding them. So it doesn't talk about functors. It doesn't talk about monoids. It doesn't talk about monads. It doesn't talk about any of those things. It just gives you the tools to do the job. And it's a really nice introduction. But I think at some point, you come across problems that the tools alone cannot solve. And you have to come up with solutions that with with slightly more abstract concepts so this is where you want to start learning about those sorts of things um i think we should be learning the names behind these patterns um so that we can identify them so that we can talk about them and that we can build upon them um one thing that we constantly battle with is complexity so there's complexity comes in two flavors. Um, there's inherent complexity, which is complexity that uh, a problem just has. There's nothing you can do about it. You you have to you just have to deal with it. But there's also accidental complexity, and this comes about from the tools that we use, um, the way we approach a problem, um, various places, and we can do a lot to control accidental complexity. For example, if we use a functional language or a pure functional language, we can we we get a lot of benefits to avoid accidental complexity and things like purity. So purity helps us. We don't have to worry about side effects. We don't worry about um, things happening outside of the thing that we're working on. Um, ability. So that stops things changing out from under us. Simplification, being explicit, so using types, uh, calling things out, the data structures that they are, making them explicit to your consumer, and being implicit, so avoiding things that, again, can change out from under you, uh, things that you may rely on, like a memory space that could change, and composition. So this is about putting building blocks together last one, which is composition. So 
composition is is the way that we control complexity. Um, we want to create simple building blocks that we can build our applications out of or our software out of quickly and precisely. Um, with these building blocks, we can use composition to put it all together. So the first pattern that I want to talk about tonight is um, monoids. I don't know, does anybody, I'm hoping that a lot of people here already know what monoids are. Can like, who, who could say that they know what they are? Okay, so only, I don't know, there's a few people. Okay, so monoids, are the, it's just a data structure. So if you look at the type signature, which is uh, an A to an A to an A, so that could be something like a number. So numbers are a monoid. Um, and the addition operator can prove that. So numbers, if we we'll, we'll step through. So addition, if we were to give one and two, it gives us three. Right, so that's a, a number, and a number gives us a number. It's pretty basic stuff. So monoids, they obey these laws. And I think this is part of like, so we want to know, we want to talk about monoids. We want to understand what they are. We want to use them in the language we talk about. And but we know when we want to create a monoid, we need to obey certain laws. So um, the first law is identity. So identity is the law where if there's for every operator, so in this case, the plus or addition, there's also paired with that is what we call an identity element. And in the case of addition and numbers, that identity element is zero. And what this means is that if I use zero and the plus operator, whatever the other, other um, argument is, that is the one that's going to come out the other side. And it doesn't matter which way around we pass those. So it's always, if I give an identity, I'm going to get the other, the other um, value as my answer. There's another law that um, monoids follow, which is associativity. So if I give, we've got one plus two, which is three. And then if we were to take the result of that, so three plus three is six. Associat associativity says that no matter which way I do the grouping of, of those um, addition operators, I'll get the same answer. So if I was to sw switch those around, if I say two and three is five, plus one is also six. So those are the two laws that, that we need to follow if we're going to try and create a monoid data structure. Now we, let's see. There's another, there's another um, operation in, in the field of numbers that, that uh, prove that numbers are a monoid as well, and this is the multiplication um, operation. So again, we're talking about identity. In the case of multiplication, one is our identity element. So one and two is two, gives us back the two. And the opposite way around is true too. And again, associativity, doesn't matter which way I group those, those operations, I'm going to get the same answer. Okay, so numbers, they're kind of basic, like what do we even use those for? Um, who knows? So there's more data structures that follow these rules. So another one is lists. Um, and lists can be proven as being a monoid with the append function. So if I was to take a list of one and two and a list of three and four, I'm going to get one, two, three, four. Quite basic, right? So there's this idea of adding or appending or concatting or all of those sorts of operations. They're all talking in the realm of monoids. So lists also have, again, the identity. So an empty list is, is the identity element for lists. So one and two plus an empty list is, or appended with an empty list is one and two. And again, doesn't matter which way around to do it, it's gonna give me the same answer. So again, associativity. So this is the second law. One, two, three, four, and then five, six. It's gonna give me one, two, three, four, five, six. 
And it doesn't matter which way I do those operations, it's still going to give me the same answer. Okay. So there's one, one more data structure that I um, actually found really interesting that it obeys these laws as well. And it kind of came from left field for me a little bit. And that's um, functions. So functions obey this law as well. I mean, it's a certain type of function. So it's an A to an A. So if we give three functions, uh, sorry, two functions that do that, we can compose a third function. So for example, if we've got the function plus one, which takes in an integer, gives back an integer, or takes in a number, gives back a number, um, and times two, which obeys the same um, type, we're gonna get a, a new function, which will take in an integer, add one times by two, give back an integer. They have an identity, and conveniently, this is called identity. So I don't know if you guys have heard of that before. I'm guessing you probably have. Um, so again, if I have, I, all that identity is, is a function that returns the, the, the value that you give it. So if I was to take plus one, and then a function that just returns the value I give it, it's kind of like doing nothing at all. So we're just going to get back plus one. And again, doesn't matter which way I do that, I'm still going to get the same answer. So associativity falls into, um, oh, sorry, functions still obey the associativity law as well. So no matter which way I compose these functions, I'm going to get the same answer. So in this case, it doesn't matter if I compose one and times two first, and then compose the answer with plus three, I'm going to get plus one times two plus three. Or if I do times two plus three first, and then take plus one with that answer, I'm still going to get plus one times two plus three. So monoids allow us to compose data structures of the same type. And I think um, what's useful is looking at the type signature. So if we just hop back, uh, we'll go all the way. I probably should put a slide in like that. Anyway, if we do, we just look, got to look out for this A to A to A. And it's a sign that we're, we're talking about monoids. Let's get back to where I was. Okay, keep going. Okay, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about was, um, so I talked about when I first started was uh, about mapping, reducing, filtering. So there's a term for mapping, or the data structure that can be mapped, and that's functors. So I often, like, we talk about, well, in the JavaScript community at least, we talk about mapping, but we don't, I, I don't think many people actually have an idea of what the term is behind it, or how to talk about it, or what else you can map. So functors are the way, a, a, a data structure that basically can be mapped. That's all that it is. And all that you have to do is give it a function of A to B. And then, so in this case, a functor of A, it's going to give you back a functor of B. So a good example again, and you're going to see this coming up a lot, is lists. So lists are a functor as well. So they're a monoid and they're a functor. And if I give, so if I've got this plus one operation and I pass it into my map, so this is my plus one is an A to a B, or in this case, it's actually a number to a number. You can see, pass it in, and then I'm going to get back a function, which is a list of A to a list of B, or in this case, a list of numbers to a list of numbers. So if I was to apply that, I've got one, two, three, and then the answer is two, three, four. So, <clears throat> Just to reiterate what I said earlier, is that um, in terms of complexity and composition, um, we want to create these simple building blocks. And in this case, the plus one is that simple building block. And then we use these other functions, so using the functor map, to put those things together and use them to our advantage. And in this case, we don't even need to know that we're dealing with lists. So we're just using the plus one. That's it. So again, functor laws. So functors obey these certain laws. And they obey the same first law that 
um, that monoids do, and that is the, the identity law. So if I was to pass in the identity to the map, I should be able to exercise the, the resulting function, whatever its input is, will be its output. They also obey this law called composition. So this composition states that if I have two maps or multiple maps in a row, so in this case, I'm going to take one, two, three, map with plus one, which give me two, three, four, and then I'm going to map that again with times two, four, six, eight. It's exactly the same. Well, not, okay, not exactly, but it gives me the same result as composing those two functions and then calling map once. And this is quite useful because you think, like if you're doing complex operations, you don't want intermediary lists, right? You just want to do the map once. So you should just compose your plus one times two, and you're going to get the same result. So another good example of uh, functor. So streams are, you think of values over time. So if we've got a stream that comes in one, two, one, one, going to get back out two, three, two over time. So they're, they're like lists, right? Lists over time. Again, this obeys the identity. So I'm going to get the same stream out if I use use the identity function in, in the map. We can also compose those things. Plus one times two. Combine them. Same answer. We don't only have to map collections. So another another thing that we can another data structure that we can map on is uh, a maybe. So a maybe is um, two cases. You've got either a nothing or you've got just of something. And so in this case, you've got uh, you've got either the maybe a is either going to be nothing or it's going to be just an a. So we can look at mapping those two things. So in the top case, we've got the maybe it has a value, so it's just one, and we map plus one, we're going to get back out just two. And what's really nice about the map, again, is that you're abstracted from the data type of the maybe. All that you're talking about is the plus one it's in the map. Same for the bottom case. So uh, maybes have a kind of a special case where if there's nothing in there, we can't map it, so we're just going to return nothing. They follow the identity. So if you give the map an ID or identity, you're going to get back out the same result. Composition holds true. So again, plus one times two, same, gives you the same answer. So functors allow us to define transformations free of the functor. Define a, our plus one or our, real, our complex operation, and we don't even have to worry that we're operating on a maybe or a list or a stream or any other functor. So the last one, last data structure that I want to talk about is foldables. And uh, so <clears throat> the, a foldable, we talk about reducing, uh, we talk about fold left, fold right, they're all in this realm of foldables. And foldables take in uh, an, a value and uh, like an accumulator or uh, can be the initial value and then it's going to return the same type of the accumulator. If I, I probably can demonstrate this a little bit better. So um, our favorite thing that seems to do everything is a list. So if we were to take our fold left function, or this is the same as a reduce, um, and we're going to load it up with our plus operator, which in this case it's an A to an A to A, but that also meets the criteria for an A to a B to a B. And then we're going to take an, an initial value, zero. Those two things go away, and now I've just got a function which is a list A, to a B, or in this case, it's a list of numbers, and it's going to give me back out a single number here. So if I give one, three, two, it's going to add all of those numbers together, give me six. So what's interesting about um, foldables is that we can 
feed in one type and we can get out another. So in this case, we give it a list and we're going to get it back out a number. So or a list of numbers and we're going to get it back out the number. Um, another thing that we can do with foldables is filtering. So we can, in this example, we're going to just keep the odd numbers. For the one, three, two, we're going to get rid of the two because it's not odd. And we're going to get back one, three. So it talks about you can maintain the same type, but you're going to end up with a collection of things which has less, less items in it, or even has no items in it. So again, foldables. So this gets a little bit fuzzy. So foldable laws, there's a bit of debate around what is a foldable law or not. I don't want to get into that too deeply. Uh, but there is this concept of uh, something that is pure. So uh, every um, foldable or every, like data structures have a way that you can put a value inside of them. So in the case of a list, um, if I give you a six, I can put that inside of a list. So if we take pure, and we're going to come back to our append function that we saw from the monoids, if we take both of those, fold L is defined as compose pure, and I flip the first two arguments of append, use those as my reducer, or my, my fold function, if I give in 132, I'm going to get back out 132. That's it. We also have a rule for fold right, where we don't need to flip the append. So if I give in 132, I get back out 132. It's kind of weird. It's hard to explain. This is the law. Apparently, I'm the sheriff. <laughs> So foldables allow us to reduce or um, decrease the size of a collection into a singular value. And they also allow us to transform um, into a foldable of a different size. And this is, again, similar to the functors where it's all free of the, the initial foldable type. You don't have to, the function that you define of the A to B to B, you don't need to concern yourself with the foldable. Just like with the functors map, it's an A to a B, you don't have to concern yourself with the functor. So where to from here? Um, I think we should be learning these concepts. And there's a lot of them. In, in the functional realm, we talked about monoids, we talked about functors, we talked about foldables, but these are all other things that you can go explore. Um, there's some further reading. So uh, I don't know if anyone's read Lambda Cat's blog before. Uh, she has a really good article on uh, the Midnight Monad or a Midnight Monad, and it's her it details her journey into discovering what a monad is that everybody needs to go on that journey um, and kind of have these things click in their head. Uh, she refers to um, the, this blog called uh, by Edit, um, Functors, Applicatives and Monads, who uh, steps you through from functors, which hopefully you've learned a bit about tonight, um, through to applicatives and into monads. And it's a really good blog. It's got really good illustrations. It's quite easy to digest. Um, after that, I would suggest checking out Brian Beckman's uh, chat about, he does like a video chat about Don't Fear the Monad, um, where he talks about monoids and then uh, to monads and how you can um, figure those things out. Uh, there's also Learn Your Haskell, which is an online book about um, various operations and things like that you can do in Haskell and learning the concepts there. And then there's also a um, JavaScript spec for implementing um, these laws uh, called Fantasyland. So I definitely recommend if you're interested in this sort of stuff, um, go check out those and hopefully let your monad journey begin. That's it.
Uh, does anyone have any questions? Maybe I should have linked that up. Okay, um, I, I don't know. Um, to be honest, I'm pretty new to all of this stuff, so I'd be keen to chat about this more afterwards. Um, but I did show that there is a function that you can um, that you can write that of an A to a B to a B that will. Uh, so the B is is the accumulator, not the value inside. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. So in in the first example that I showed, um, which was a list to a number, um, that you're never going to be able to then turn that magically into a number again. You have to maintain the list. So you're going to actually have an A to an A to an A, like not an A to a B to a B. You know, a list, and you're going to return a list, and so forth. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it has its benefits, right? So you can definitely use it within JavaScript. You lose some of the benefits of, so unless you're using some immutability library or something like that, you like, it's hard to do comparison of two values. So like, in order to compare two objects, you have to do a deep um, check because often they're not the same, they're not the same instance, right? Um, but there's so many concepts there that are very useful and, and really helpful for us to learn. And I think, uh, coming back to like my slide on complexity, um, being explicit, it's really easy to be implicit within JavaScript. And what I've learned through doing the functional stuff and using Elm is that actually being explicit is really helpful. Um, and I think we can do more to, uh, within JavaScript, you probably have to be um, a bit more, uh, what do you call it? Um, you have to work a bit harder, right? It's, it's not just there for you. you. You have to be conscious of it and you have to um, be explicit. Yeah. I think, can I yeah. Something? I think the language itself has some limitations, like, for example, if you want to do composition, you need a function that accepts one argument and that's where the query helps uh, JavaScript. Yeah. It doesn't support it and I don't think they will, but. Yeah. It's gonna break so many things. So but you can use there are libraries out there, right? It's gonna be verbose, right? Yeah, I mean but I mean, some of the, you look at also some of the new additions like uh, lambda functions, you know, those sorts of things. So arrow functions. Yeah. They they help a lot and they help you write one argument functions really easily as well. There's probably a bit of overhead there. Yeah. Um, that's actually the thing that uh, they find me that Basically, I like the language is that you can do many things uh, without writing so much code. Yeah. And I think that's going to be an observer. Yeah, I mean, my suggestion would be use a language that compiles to JavaScript if you want to use it on the web, right? There's so many of them coming around. And I mean, like at the moment, I'm super interested in ReasonML as well. Um, there's, there's so much going on in the space. So there's, there's a language out there for you, I reckon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane. Um, we're going to have a five minute break to talk about those interviews in the toilet, which is always me. Um, and then we'll resume five minutes to uh, listen to Shu's talk.
Okay, so then if I pull this over. Um, actually, I think I do want to mirror. Thanks. Hi. Welcome back. Uh, so, David Harris is the CIA of uh, and he's uh, been sort of just about the same thing Joe touched on, Fantasyland, um, and excuse me, Oh, is that better? That's better. I could hear myself back through there. Uh, sorry, hi, welcome. Um, my name is Stuart Harris. Um, I'm the founder of Rebadget. I've um, I spent like 15 years doing object orientation, and it's like, fuck that shit. <laughs> um, and <laughs> during that time, um, I played with F Sharp a little bit, and that's sort of kind of whetted my appetite for all of this stuff. Um, and but. And since then, I've been trying desperately to try and get myself and every Rebadger to do more, more functional programming to, and to actually introduce functional concepts into um, the day to day job. Um, a colleague of mine once said that um, learn a new language every single year. Um, and even if you don't use it as your main thing, then you can still use the stuff from all of that and um, the things that you learn makes you a better programmer in what you do do. So um, some of the things we're going to talk about tonight are uh, from Elm. I must actually first of all apologize if you've heard this talk before because I gave it at the React meetup. Um, but how many people here uh, have written an, an Elm program? And how many people will use Elm in their like day-to-day, -day, like have written a commercial, you know, commercially written Elm? Yeah, so this is the problem. Is because um, we're kind of tied to JavaScript a little bit, and especially um, you know in large organisations. You know, if you suggest that you're going to build something in Elm, they can go. Ah. Uh, so, but some of the some of the ideas in this talk are not really fully formed, and um, they just what some things that I've been playing with, trying to sort of like allow help us do m more functional programming. I think we can do lots of like low dash FP and Ramdo and all that sort of stuff and you know map and reduce and and write little functions and and then but there's a lot more to it than that as Joe showed us. And I and I think that um we can we should always be exploring ways in which we can sort of like weave functional concepts into into the stuff we we're doing. So I want to talk about um dealing with 
um, and unexpected outcomes effectively or failures or whatever because um, well this is inspired this talk is inspired by this blog post by Chris Jenkins um, about slaying a UI anti pattern um, in Elm and then I don't know if anybody's read this post but it's pretty good um, it's pretty cool it shows how how Elm doesn't allow you to make the sorts of mistakes that we make every day in our in JavaScript applications and then um, this post which is about slaying a UI anti pattern in fantasy land which you've Joe mentioned, which we'll talk about in a second. And then uh, there's someone else laying in a UI anti pattern with flow. And you know, there's a whole series of these sort of like um, different ways of solving the same sort of problem. Um, but it's, I think it's worth uh, looking at some of these. So this this post is um, how I'm um, slays a UI anti pattern. And the, the problem is this. Um, It looks like when you first load an application or whatever, it looks like you don't have any messages or whatever. It's just, it's not that you don't have any, it's just they've not been fetched yet. And we've all done this. We've all sort of like built an application where, you know, you've got an empty array of things and we haven't populated that array yet. And so the UI says well, there isn't anything. Um, and it's largely because we're using data structures like this. Um, which says that those are the th those are the things we want to load, and we've got a loading flag or whatever, so we can put a spinner. Um, but it's really a poor solution because these two things can get out of sync, and you often forget to set them correctly, and it still doesn't cater for the fact if something goes wrong, you know, the list is still going to be empty. Does that mean you haven't got any, or what? So Elm allows us to create models which are effectively algebraic data types. And um, Joe talked about the maybe monads, which it can be just or nothing. Um, and so when you've got when you use an algebraic data type in Elm and you don't handle all the possibilities, it gives you a compile time warning to say um, this case does not have branches for all possibilities. You need to account for maybe nothing. Um, which is a step in the right direction, but we can do better than that because we can have proper like disjoint unions or tagged sums, which like so this type remote data of error and a um, can be one of four things. It can be not asked, it can be loading, it can be failure of error or success of a. And it must be one of those things at all times, and um, it can only be one of those things at any time. And that allows the compiler um, to tell you when you're not handling one of those. So just in, as in that case there where we haven't handled maybe nothing, you can get an error when you haven't handled one of those things. So um, the follow-up to this post, which is what we're interested in today, I think, is slaying a UI anti-pattern in fantasy land. So the same post, the same problem described references that maybe you can use a maybe so folktale which is a library which implements all of these fantasy lands but specification um, uh, algebraic data types and monads and stuff um, in fact actually let's just have a quick look at fantasy lands so this um, this is the fantasy land specification this pretty acid trip photo picture and these are all the things that you recognize from Joe's talk um, and the fancy land is basically if you want to use all these things how would you do it in how do you do it in JavaScript and it's just a specification and the specification says that if you want to be a setoid for instance then you must follow these laws and um, this is the monoid thing so um, you can do all of this stuff in JavaScript, and providing you follow those laws, and you can write very simple tests to prove that they do follow those laws, um, and then, you, then we can get quite quite a long way. So, um, Folktale is an implementation that conforms to the fantasy land spec, and it's got a maybe monad in it, which can either be just or nothing. It can't be both; it can must be one or the other. 
Um, so we start off in our, in our state with um, items being nothing. And then when we get the stuff, we can actually set it to just an array of things. Um, and then in our render function, we can actually call this catamorphism um, on that data structure um, and provide something for each of the cases. So if, in this case, if state.items is a just, then render those things. If it's a nothing, then render the loading flag. But you can see that this isn't quite perfect, right? Because we've only either got something or we've got a loading flag and there's nothing in between. Um, so he's saying, well, actually we could create a data structure uh, called remote data, which um, very similar to the Elm thing, right? That, in fact, that is Elm, but you can in JavaScript, you can do it in a very similar way. So this is using a library called Daggy. Daggy is brilliant. It's like the smallest JavaScript library there is. And it has two things in it, tagged and tagged sum. Um, the tag sum is a disjoint union, so it just says that remote data must be um, either not asked, a loading, a failure, or a success, and it creates constructors for those things. And the not asked constructor has no arguments, the loading constructor has no arguments, the failure has one argument, which is the error, and success has one argument, which is um, the items. And we can start off with um, not asked, and um, in our view, we can go over that um, algebraic data type, and we get not our, you know we can get to handle each of those things. And the great thing is that if you miss one of those out, you get a runtime warning to say that you haven't handled this case. So it's not as good as Elm because you don't get any compile time support, um, but it's good at runtime. So. Um, and then the third one in this, slaying an anti UI anti pattern, the same thing, but with flow, um, exactly the same thing. And this is how you do it with flow. And then you do get like compile time support. Um, anyway, so I don't, does, everybody, does anybody write applications in React? And does it, who uses Redux? Okay, and who has to deal with asynchronous um, stuff over the wire, getting calling APIs and stuff? Right, okay, so lots of different ways of doing that in Redux. There's Redux Thunk, Redux Promise, Redux Sagas, Redux Future, there's probably a whole ton of others. Um, Redux Thunk, so Thunk is a function that's already closed over its arguments. So it's like it effectively becomes um, a function with no arguments that you can just run and it knows what to do. It's a pre thought, a thunked. Uh, function. Um, Redux promise allows you to um, create an action that effectively dispatches or dispatch a promise and, and that will um, happen and the result is then um, the middleware effectively will um, update the store with the result of the promise. And the Redux sagas, which is a way of um, orchestrating all your asynchronous, asynchronous activities um, using generators and yield functions. So you can effectively yield effects that describe something that's going to happen. So um, it's actually a really clean, easily testable um, way of orchestrating API calls. It's really great, and we use them a lot at Red Badger. Um, but I wanted to play a little bit with Redux Future. So R Redux Future is a tiny little, it's also Ten lines of JavaScript. It's a little bit of mid middleware, basically, that fits into Redux, which allows you to use futures instead of promises. Um, so, first of all, we should look at what a future is and why it's different to a promise. Um, so, <coughs> promises are okay. They're great, right? It's a lot better than what we had before. Um, they were in node right at the very beginning and they took them out um, because they wanted that to be an exercise in like user land they wanted like the community to come up with what promises should look like um, and so they took them out of node the community sort of gathered around worked out what and came up with the promises a plus specification and then effectively then they ended up in javascript instead of node but we've got them um, but they've got some problems, and the problem is 
in my opinion, is that really they're not very functional. Um, they're not easy to compose. And they're not. They start straight away. Um, so as soon as you create your promise, effectively something's going to start happening, and that means that the result may come back before you've added your con continuations. So it needs to con it needs to contain state, and if it contains state and it's stateful, it's not pure. And if it's um, it's not easy to compose, it's not easy to pass around. Um, you can attach your, um, your continuations later, but then they're going to work on the already resolved or already rejected promise, which means that you can only use the promise once. You can't use it multiple times because once it's happened, it's happened. So it's always single shot. Um, and they have to be safe. What else have I missed off here? So, they, so this is the major difference in my head between promises and futures is that a future in a, with a future, nothing happens straight away. Like you have to explicitly make it do something, and that's what the fork is. I'll come on to that in a second. So here's a comparison between promises and futures. Um, there's a few things that I wanted to pull out of this. Um, the first one is that with promise, you've got then, 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 but there are different thens, right? The first then um, digs into the value inside the promise, does something, and returns just a value which goes back into another promise, effectively, so it's already, it already gets wrapped into another promise for you. Um, the second one um, effectively chains two promises together, so it actually returns another promise to do something else. Um, and then the third one um, is what to do with um, the success value and what to do with the error value. Whereas the future is quite different in a sense that it's got map, chain, and fork, and but it's the same sort of thing. So you can actually see a lot of similarities there. So map allows you to dig into the future, pull its value out, do something with it, and put it back into the future. So that's exactly what Joe is talking about with map, right? Map is effectively something that works on the value inside the monad. A monad is just a box. The future is a monad. It's just a box with something in it. Um, chain allows you to um, chain two futures together. Um, so this is exactly the same sort of situation as this then. And then finally, fork is, and fork is the thing that actually kicks the whole thing off. So up until this point, nothing, nothing has actually happened. Um, so with futures, you must attach your continuations first and then run them, run it afterwards. But because um, until you run it, it doesn't have any state. All it it's so it's pure. It doesn't. All it does is it it describes your program. So, and if you used to Haskell, I don't know Haskell, but that's what Haskell's all about, right? You kind of build up the program, and it may or may not run, or a certain path through the program will run, but the the unused paths don't run. And features are very similar to that in the sense that you know we've set up we've set up this feature to do something, but it won't actually do this thing until we call fork. And that proves to be a really, really useful concept, which makes it easier to test, easier to compose, easier to pass around, um, because it's pure, and it's a monad, and it obeys all these laws. Then we can treat it in the same way as we treat any other monad, um, with map, and apply, and chain, and all that sort of stuff. So. Um, yeah, really good. Have I missed anything? Like that? Um, okay, so we talked about futures being lazy, being pure, being testable, being monadic, and this is where the fantasy land specification comes in. Composable, um, cancelable, um, which we'll look at in a second. Resort, you can manage resource resource management so you could like tidy up database connections and stuff so you can sort of intercept the flow um, to make sure that you clean up after you um, oh the other thing as well is that in um, in this this then here and um, the success is first and the error is second whereas in futures the error is first and the success is second and that's actually seems like a minor distinction but actually it's really important because it makes it much harder to not handle the error. Like in this one, you could just not miss that out and, and you just wouldn't be handling the error. And how many times have we worked with promises 
and not handle the error and it just gets swallowed and we lost it and we don't know what, what actually happened. Whereas with a future that has that's first. So you'd have to like deliberately put something in there to swallow the error. Um, otherwise it's going to so, so a bit more reliable as well. The error handler is not, op not optional. But this quote here is actually really interesting. So we talked earlier about um, how promises were pulled out of Node, then put back in, put into JavaScript. Um, the promises A plus spec, which is what came out of that exercise, um, somebody wanted to say, why didn't you use futures instead of promises? Because futures are much more functional, and it would actually be really really nice to do it properly rather than sort of like not properly and and then the creators of the promise a plus said there this is really not happening it totally ignores reality in favor of hype hyped language fantasy land and that's where the name fantasy land came from um and the whole fantasy land specification is based on based on this which is actually really really interesting um so and as to the rescue, right. Um, this quote at the bottom here, which is brilliant. So um, Douglas Crockford um, made a very valiant attempt, actually, to describe what monads are at a conference, a YUI conference in 2012. And he's, <laughs> he suggested that once you understand monads for yourself, you lose the ability to explain them to anyone else. And um, it's kind of true. So I'm not even going to attempt to explain them, but basically, they're just oh, it's just a box a container with a value inside it just like a list is a container for a you know, bunch of values you can put anything inside a monad it's just a value you can even put a function or a functor inside a monad um, and it, and it's a standard shape box like i don't know i guess a bit like a container that has a, a very specific interface and, and conforms to all these laws laws which make it allow it to be very versatile and you don't actually care what's inside it um, and you can treat it exactly the same way and all these monads like futures and the maybe monad and the either monad that can be either one thing or another it's got a left and it's got a right the maybe it's got a just and a nothing um, they're all they're all monads and you can do really clever things with them but ultimately it's just a box with a value in it and you use map to work on the value inside it um, and you use apply or app 8.ap um, to take another monad that's got a function inside it and apply that function to the value inside that box. So you can kind of like work with functions and values inside the boxes without actually um, knowing or caring what, what they are. Um, but the great thing is they solve a massive problem in functional programming, and that is that if in, in a functional programming um, in a functional program, uh, where everything is pure, where all the functions are pure, you you can't really get state to where you need it to be. <laughs> so especially like a side effect, right? Imagine like if you want to actually run a side effect with just pure functions, and this is a problem that Haskell has, and that's why you need monads like the I/O monad and stuff like that, is because um, it's the only way to to really um, kind of inject. <laughs> A side effect which has got to be injected from the outside of the program because um, the rest of the program is pure so you can't have side effects you kind of need to get it to where it needs to be so you can actually do something useful and monads are useful for getting carrying that state to where you need it uh, closures are a bit like that because they allow functions to carry state around because when you close over the values around the function they, they effectively become part of the state of that function. So it's a stateful function, effectively. That thunk, um, in Redux thunk we were talking about earlier, that is um, cl a closure, effectively, and it's got, it's got state. It's captured the arguments. But they're not pure because they're dependent on how the function was actually created in the first place because it's pulled in state from outside. And a pure function, obviously, is only pure if... if um, it always gives the same output for its argument, for its uh, return value for the, for the arguments you give it. Uh, yeah, we're doing functional programming little lines. So yeah, I think yeah, we we try and we use like low dash fp and Ramda and all these great things to do like little bits of functional stuff all over the place. But as soon as you try and 
build a big application or something out of just purely functional concepts, you run into this problem. You've got to get your side effects. You've got to keep your side effects on the edge and inject them in, and Monad's a way to do that. Um, so I think we should look at some code. Um, so this might go hideously wrong, because that's what happens. Um, but this is just literally a Redux application um, that was built with Create React app, and it's not very exciting at all. But what it does is it trying to demonstrate the concepts in that in those blog posts about um, slaying the UI anti patterns. So this is the not asked state. So I haven't asked for anything yet, and that, that is please click today or tomorrow. Um, if I click today, we've got a loading while it goes and fetches the data from the API, and now we've got the success state, and we'll look at the error state in a minute. Um, and tomorrow is the same, the loading and the thing. So let's have a look at that code. So the first thing I think which is interesting is um, the React component. So this, this is the action, this is the um, state, effectively the props. And this is an algebraic data type. Let's look at that data type, um, which is remote data.js. So this is exactly the same as in that blog post. Those are the four um, states that can be, not states, the four different types. That, um, and this is Daggy's tagged sum. So it just basically creates this object with four um, constructors. And I'm just exporting them. So in the in the view, we can run this catamorphism over that algebraic data type, and we have to handle all four situations. So let's just have a look. We'll come on to the actions in a second. But if I like put a, a bad um, URL in here, this should reload. So now what happens is if I click today, failed to fetch. So that's that's the error. Let's go back to here. Yeah, that's this failure thing here. And that was the message that was passed through. So let's have a look at how that is actually passed through. So the interesting thing is um, the actual action creator. So the, it's the action get scheduled today or tomorrow. These are the actions. So I'm just using Redux action to create an action of type get schedule. But I don't know. I always used to think that it's great to kind of do quite a lot in the reducers and very little in the action creators. Um, that's why Redux Saga um, appealed to me because you don't even have to create promises or anything or thunks or anything in the action creator. They're just an action, just a, an object that says this is what, you're, what I want you to do. But actually, we could take a very functional approach and actually um, create um, a future in our action. So this get schedule action creator effectively calls this fetch data, which is um, a future of remote data of ENA. So here's the, the first thing we want to do is make a URL. Um, we've, we're passing in it injecting our side effect, which is fetch JSON. That's just, um, just returns a promise. What does it look like, side effects? It effectively just returns a promise for the JSON. But I'm futurizing it. And futurizing it is literally just a case of wrapping the promise in a future. So this is the promise, there's the then, and it'll either resolve or reject into the future. Um, so now this is a future of um, some JSON. And we're going to fold that um, into either a failure or a success. So failure and success are from that remote data. data. So they're the two, two types, remote data types. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to fold the success branch of this and the error branch, so first the error branch and then, then the success branch into this data structure. 
So from here onwards, we're effectively abandoning the rejection branch of the future and actually just using future. But we're taking the rejection branch of the future and folding it into this data type. So now the error, if there is one, is captured in here in the failure and the, the data that is captured in the success. So we can just use Ramdas Compose to compose a function called HTTP get, um, which will do that. And then we can compose HTTP get um, make URL so that we've now got the function fetch data, which will, which given a URL will return a future of remote data of EOA. So the remote data of EOA captures everything. It could be not asked, it could be loading. It's not going to be in this in this situation. We'll look at that in a second. Um, or it could be a failure or it could be a success. And then the rest of it is just really simple. We just, this is a function that um, knows how to get the broadcast from the data that come, comes back. This tags is also from Daggy. So this is the other thing that's in Daggy. There are two things in Daggy, tagged sum and tagged. Tagged effectively just creates um, an object with those three properties on it. That's all, all it does. So I can create, um, gives you a function here, which, which given those three arguments will return an object with an ID, a title and a start. So that's, that effective, that function effectively just does that transform. And then finally, and this is something that monads do. If you want to map with a, with a maybe monad, for instance, you'd probably want to short circuit um, the situation where it's nothing. And you showed this in, in your slide. If it's if if it's nothing, it always goes to nothing. So in other words, whatever happened, whatever was happening in the map was short circuited, and that's the short circuit in this transform. But if it's if it is a success, then effectively we want to get the broadcasts of the data and map them um, and then create this uh, return a success. Um, so here we've got, this returns a monad, so we can map over it. This is um, Ramda's map. All Ramda's functions work with the fantasy land spec now. So um, you, know, you can use the same map to map over lists, over monads or anything. Um, so we're going to map over that feature with the transform, um, and then that pipes just pipes one into the other. It's like composed but backwards. And that. So if we look at the tests here, um, which might ex might help us understand it a little bit, um, we don't have to here. We don't have to inject um, any dependencies. We can just run this because nothing's going to happen. <laughs> until we call fork and we're not calling fork in this test. So we can already do quite a bit of testing without having to worry about side effects or anything like that. So um, this test just makes sure that it's a flux standard action of the right type. This makes sure that it must um, use a feature. And if we actually want to do it with some sample data, for instance, we can just create a little mock fetch JSON, which is a promise for some data and then we can inject that into there. So, so now this is a function that create. This is our action creator function, um, and we can call. We can create the action. Still, nothing has happened. If that was a promise, the promise would already be off doing something already. Um, but because of the future, it's not. It's lazy. It's just just describing what should happen. And um, because this is an asynchronous test, we're going to re, uh, return a promise. And we're going to fork um, the future. This is the action has a payload. It's a flux standard action, and that payload is the future for the remote data type. Um, we, as we said, we're not doing anything with the rejection branch, so that if we get something there, we should fail the test. Um, but we are interested in the success branch, and the success branch is, um, if it all worked, is going to be. We should ex we should expect to see a success of broadcast. Um, and then we can resolve the promise and the test will pass. Um, and then if, if, if it errors, so in other words, if our mock data, uh, function for a prom promise for the data actually throws, then we should expect that it's going to fold into a failure with the error in it. So I think that's quite an easy way of testing that. So it's really straightforward. Um, 
it's pure, it's functional. Um, the actions um, allow you to compose all these things and actually be, be really functional in the way you do it. But most importantly, oh, and in the reducer, you don't have to do anything at all. You can just effectively st store that. Um, by the time Redux future has gone through the middle where the payload is now not a future or something, it's either um, it is the, the remote data type. So this is now the remote data. So it starts off as being not asked. It's loading. I've got some little middleware that effectively sets it to loading before it, before it actually then. So in the middleware, we dispatch a loading, and this isn't brilliant. It could be improved. Um, and then we actually fork the future, and then um, this would never happen because we're not interested in the error branch anymore, and the, res and the success branch effectively just puts it on the payload, <laughs> which means that when we actually come to our view, we can do stuff like this. So this works. We put the URL back. But if I take not asked out, um, then application doesn't even load. And in the console, it says um, constructions get constructors given to Cata didn't include not asked. So we get some like runtime checking to say that we didn't actually deal with something. So I discovered that during the last time I did this talk, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, so um, we uh, talked about Daggy, which is effectively just the tagged type, which gives you an object with those properties, or a function that a constructor that take that so will give you an object with those properties, and tags some. Um, um, which allows you to, so this is effectively like the maybe monad, but it's just an algebraic data type that has some or none, and it has the catter on it. Um, so that was Daggy. And then the other the other thing which is really cool is Fluture, which is the future library which I was using, which is Fantasy Lang compliant. And I forgot to talk about this last time, but it's got some really, really good documentation which really easily describes um, all the things it can do, the futures can do, um, how to use them, um, all the monadic uh, function methods that it has, um, and it does some. This allows some really interesting things. So there's the map. By map allows you to map over both the error and the success branch. Chain allows you to chain another future, um, which we looked at. App, app allows you to apply a monad that has a functor inside it to the value inside the success branch of the future. Um, swap allows you to swap the, the two, the future, the re reject and the success, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's got some really nice, so there's the fork um, parallelism. So you can run multiple futures in parallel um, and you can specify what the parallelism is. You can run you can do ands and ors and like run them like promise to all, which would be the end. Um, and the like or which is like <laughs> first one to succeed. Um, or both. It's the same as parallel and you can, this is this is five times parallel, infinity parallel. Uh, really, really cool. Um, and it allows you to do resource management as well, which um, and cancellation. So the resource management allows you to hook in and close database connections and all that sort of stuff if it goes wrong. Um, so you're really quite advanced now. And it's, there's lots of things that implement the fantasy land specification. So there's Sanctuary, there's Ramda fantasy land, which has got a whole load of them in it. Um, Folktale, uh, this one. Um, yeah, go play. That's it, I think. Thank you. Um, those are the links if anybody wants them. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah, oh dear, I hate this bit. It's just like a new future, yeah. So you could hold a reference to a future um, and then just fork it. 
and I'm going to use some of the water that you like in New York. So you can't do that with promises, obviously, because once they're done, they're done. They're just pure. Um, so yeah, you can do exactly that. Um, it's more a small question. Um, yeah. So that's like a hierarchy, like um, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Yeah. So in this sense, like um, um, all monads are functors, but all functors are monads. And the yeah. hierarchy is functor, a primitive functor, which yeah. is that, yeah. and then monad. Yeah. So the reason why I'm saying is because you said monad a lot of times, yeah. but you could actually have an opinion to counter that wasn't monad. Yeah. So, uh, right, which to use with the app. With, with exactly. The app, yeah. So the, the only thing is, yeah. you can have functors that are not monads. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming, thanks for the speakers. Um, if you'd like to submit a talk, you can do by emailing hello at the.com <coughs> or go to the meetup. Um, and I suppose we'll be posting the details of next year's meetup. I don't think we'll have one in December, maybe it's but yeah, in the new year. Um, so keep watching. Uh, thanks all, have a good Christmas.